The milk flows sour through the land of Canaan. The honey is crusted and dry in the desert sun. The cries of an ancient and bitter conflict rot on tired branches. Why do the archaic cries of holy men ring empty through plywood pews? Where did the degenesis begin? In the beginning, man said let there be God, and there was God. From chaos was born order, by the cradle Euphrates. From Anna, in Lil, Ninkasag and Enki, came Yahweh. And man saw that Yahweh was good. But man's work was not done. And man said, let us know our form, and let us control it. So man conjured the anatomists. These creatures of paradox healed the living by day and dissected the dead by night. The Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, and Persians all dug into human flesh in search of answers, but God's grasp was still strong, for man still thought him to be the master of health and of sickness, the author of life and of death. In the Dark Age and the Renaissance, the anatomists were still crude, speaking of cloudy concepts, humor, temper, nature, element. In modern times, man finally pushed God into a corner, leaving its muscles to atrophy, and weaken. Through their knowledge of the very small, they accomplished the very large. Men no longer looked to God for healing, but instead to other men. They worshipped the pill, the needle, the scalpel, not the Lord. They damned the bacterium, the virus, the cancer, not the serpent. Men, like machines, could most often be fixed. God no longer had the power of a healer, or a hurter. And he would soon be stripped of his role as a creator. And there was evening, and there was morning. The first day. And man said, Let us know our origins. Let us know how we came to be. So Darwin was born, and he was sent down to the islands of Galapagos, where a finch whispered in his ear. Man came from the ape. And the finch told Darwin of adaptation, of selection, of mutation. So Darwin published on the origin of species so that all of mankind could know their heritage. It was known that every birth stood the chance of genetic mutation, and that if that mutation proved to be advantageous in the species environment, then the creature would be more likely to survive until reproduction. And so the ape, little by little, begot man. God and his men cried with outrage, for now it was known that God was not the creator, but rather a creation. God wept at the loss of his creative powers, and soon he would lose his ability to destroy. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And man said, Let us know why the earth shakes, why the mountains spout fire, why the wind blows, why the sea crashes, and why light snipes at us from the sky. So they learned that the earth is constantly shifting. They learned of the tectonic plates that make up the land, and of the fault lines that make them tremble. Man apprehended that the shaking of the earth conjures colossal waves that sometimes wash away the cities, and they understood that the diverging and converging of the plates lets hot magma from below the earth's crust rise up. 
of the harsh storms, man learned that the tropical water evaporates and forms a terrifying cyclone as it is pulled into low pressure areas. Man got wind of tornadoes formed by the meeting of the warm and the cold, the wet and the dry. Finally, they heard that the terrifying light was nothing more than electrical discharge from the clouds. God, once prayed to for mercy, watched his masterpieces shrink to physicality. He cowed at the thunderous roar of man's mind. And so the earth was taken from the hands of God, and next would come the sky. And there was evening, and there was morning. The third day. And man said, Let us know what lies beyond the skies, and let us know the great truths of the universe. The ancients, among them Aristotle and Ptolemy, built celestial spheres around the earth. This pleased God, for man was at the center of existence, and all revolved around them in harmonious circular motion. The teachings of Ptolemy would stand untested until the arrival of Copernicus, who shook man's vision of the world. He taught that Earth was not the center of existence, but instead the Sun. The men of God refused this unholy model, for it challenged all that they knew. Galileo would support Copernicus and impart more secrets of the cosmos, braving the vicious outcries of God's men. The men of ignorance could no longer keep their eyes closed, and even the most devoted among them were forced to accept the Copernican truth, that Helios was the center of their existence, and that Helios itself was at the periphery of larger bodies. Man would continue to learn of the stars, and as they shrank in comparison to the ever-expanding world, so did God whose miserable cries could scarcely be heard amidst the great quiet of the universe, and so God was usurped from its home in the cosmos, and soon it would be reduced to a mere watchmaker. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And man said, Let us know what guides motion. Let us know the laws that govern the natural world. So Newton was born, and his sacred writings in the Principia became the Bible of the natural philosophers. He described the forces that guide motion. He wrote three all-encompassing laws that impose their tyrannical ruling on all the celestial bodies as well as the earthly ones. The motion of large bodies was understood, and with the shiny tool of calculus, they could easily be predicted. The natural world operated on its own accord. God had no immediate power over its occurrences. The universe became a massive and intricate watch, governed entirely by mechanics. Though men in these times still believed God to be the creator, it was rationalized that God was the divine watchmaker, who set the clockwork universe in motion but could no longer intervene. But as we well know, Darwin would come and rob God of these powers. And so God, no longer the creator, nor the regulator of man's mischief, was battered and bruised due to Newton's knowledge of the large. And it would soon be known that he was equally powerless in the domain of the small. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day.
And man said, Let us know what is smaller than the small. So man set out to explore the wondrous land of Quanta. All that was certain in the land of Newton was cast into shadowy doubt. The creatures in the land of the small played devilish tricks. The more man learned of their speed, the less man knew of their position. So Heisenberg christened the uncertainty principle. All was random in the realm of chaos. Einstein bellowed. God does not play dice, and man laughed. The little devils, at one instant particles, and the next waves, fooled man to no end. But one thing was certain. God's hand guided nothing in the land of the small. And man built the Large Hadron Collider so that he could know the beginnings of the universe itself. In this tunnel of knowledge, man would smash particles into one another, not only for revenge on the little devils, but also to catch a fleeting glimpse of what they called the Big Bang. God cringed at every fire of the canonical cannon, for every smash brought man one step closer to the true origin of the universe, and one step further from him. And when man was finished, he knew all there was to know. And God wept. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens, and the earth were known. And on the seventh day, man rested and reflected on the work of the anatomists, the evolutionists, the geologists, the astronomers, and the physicists. Man was pleased with what he had done, for he had grown tired of God's tyranny in ages of old, but he cried with surprise to see, upon his in reflection, the very image of God. And God whispered, for his voice was hoarse, I am belief. I am as human as intellect, as emotion, as conscience. You cannot vanquish me. It is true that you have cut me out of colloquial existence. It is true that you have exposed my lies. I am not the sower, nor the reaper. I am not your way, or Allah, or Christ. These are but labels, but in your moments of purest contemplation, of purest connection with life and with death, you will see me, and I will be true. And man wept. <laughs> 